To the person in the bell jar, blank and stopped as a dead baby, the world itself is a bad dream. The Bell Jar, written by Sylvia Plath and published by Faber and Faber, tells the story of Esther Greenwood, who, in the summer of 1953, is living in New York City, significantly during the same time that Julius and Ethel Rosenberg are to be executed just upstate. Esther, although ecstatic over having won a position as guest editor on a college board for a famous woman's magazine, is equally puzzled that she is not having the time of her life. On the face of it, she has everything going for her. She is successful, attractive, intelligent, and talented. Why is she feeling depressed? Is it because the city glamour she expected manifests itself not in an exciting whirlwind adventure, but instead as a series of slapdash episodes wherein, behind the glittery surfaces, she sees a trivial world of competition, meanness, and fakery? This tale is one of diametric oppositions, glamour and squalidness, hope and despair, success and failure, sanity and insanity, all figured through the life of this protagonist as she attempts to navigate the course through to adulthood. As Review in the New Yorker suggests, the bell jar begins in New York with an ominous lightness, grows darker as it moves to Massachusetts, then slips slowly into madness. Although not an autobiographical account in the same way as I know why the caged bird sings and educated, the fictional Esther Greenwood shares many similarities with her author Sylvia Plath, a theme alluded to in The Bell Jar. I saw my life branching out before me like a green fig tree in the story, from the tip of every branch, like a fat purple fig, a wonderful future beckoned and winked. I saw myself sitting in the crotch of this fig tree, starving to death, just because I couldn't make up my mind which of the figs I would choose. I wanted each and every one of them, but choosing one meant losing all the rest. And as I sat there, unable to decide, the figs began to wrinkle and go black. And, one by one, they plopped to the ground at my feet. Sylvia Plath was born in Boston, Massachusetts in 1932, when she was eight years old, her father died after a long illness. This early loss affected Plath's writing in a way that would be unparalleled to any other event in her life. It was indeed about the time of her father's death that Plath began to write poetry and short fiction. Of her first foray into poetry, Plath goes on to suggest, I just wrote. I guess I liked nursery rhymes, and I guess I thought I could do the same thing. I wrote my first poem my first published poem, when I was eight and a half years old. It came out in the Boston Traveler, and from then on, I suppose, I've been a bit of a professional. Her works won several newspaper contests, and in August of 1950, she sold her first story, And Summer Will Not Come Again, to Seventeen Magazine, a young woman's magazine similar to the fictional one described in the novel The Bell Jar. Despite winning many accolades, including a fellowship to the illustrious Smith College and a Fulbright scholarship to Cambridge, Plath nonetheless consistently battled with severe depression and, as a result of a suicide attempt, went into psychiatric care, where she received counseling and more invasive treatment, electroshock therapy. This experience forms yet another similarity between herself and her fictional character in The Bell Jar. Her first novel was published in January of 1963 under the pseudonym of Victoria Lewis, as Plath wanted her real name to be associated only with her poetry. She also adopted the nom de plume with the added hope of sparing the feelings of friends and family members who appear in the novel as thinly disguised fictional characters. A consistently high level of symbolism is found throughout all Plath's works, including The Bell Jar. Some critics have interpreted these symbols as Plath's own movement toward her inevitable suicide shortly after the publication of the novel, while others locate the use of symbolism as a method whereby the poet and author transforms personal events into something more universal, a general image in which readers can find their own meaning. 
The autobiographical nature of the bell jar and the introspective glimpses provided by many of her later poems, which were published after her death in Ariel in 1965 and The Crossing of Water in 1972, gave a new impetus to the confessional style of poetry. Leading figures of this literary movement included Robert Lowell, who wrote the introduction to Ariel, and May Sarton, the author of A Private Mythology in 1966. Why not click and collect or download the ebook version of The Bell Jar so as to arrive at your own interpretation 